Good morning. Welcome to this service, the Sunday before Christmas. We have a special treat for you today. This is the Edge Kids Christmas Choir. These are our first through sixth graders under the direction of Patty Steele with assistance from Wendy Chikowski.
says, and they came with haste. Hey, Elijah, who's haste? Shh, Kayla. Haste must be one in the name of the shepherds. And found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. All three of them lying in a manger? Bet it was kind of crowded. Yeah, for real. Hey, Cora. Yeah? Well, uh... Elijah wants to know what happened next. Well, it was like this.
together, Jesus Emmanuel. Jesus Emmanuel, oh come let us adore Him. Jesus Emmanuel, oh come let us adore Glory to 
Pastor Ed, he brought a great message. Uh, one of the verses that he pointed to was in Luke chapter 1. And I'll be reading this ver uh, these three verses, verses 30 through 33. And here's the angel Gabriel. He's, he's uh, in explaining to Mary what's going to happen. It says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end.
Amen, church. He's going to reign forever. He reigns today. Amen? Amen. Hey, you guys can take a seat. In the book of Luke, we read about the most exciting event to ever happen in our world, the birth of Christ. Luke's gospel lays out a story filled with anticipation, intrigue, wonder, and hope-filled news for humankind. It was the day when God's great plan of salvation and redemption was irrevocably launched. And as we look to the cast of characters God gathered together, our eyes are open to a new response, focus, and growth in the Christmas season. As we begin to understand, like the shepherds, the joy that comes with receiving the truth of Christ. Are you aware that there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding the nativity? Most of our mental images about Christmas come from medieval art or from Christmas cards. And so I just want to give you a heads up. You might want to push back in these next moments because I'm going to dismantle some of the myths you may have in your minds. For instance, number one, there's no evidence Mary rode on a donkey to Bethlehem. Luke chapter 2 only says Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem not how they got there. Number two, the innkeeper is not even mentioned in the Bible. Luke 2.7 simply says there was no place for them in the inn. Related to that, there's no record of the innkeeper saying these words, there's no room in the inn. Do you want me to stop? Is it okay if I keep going? <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, you guys are breaking out in a sweat here. Number four, the Bible doesn't say Jesus was born immediately after they arrived. Luke 2 verse 6 says this, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Number five, we don't know the exact day of Jesus' birth. It's actually more likely he was born in the spring or in the fall, but it's totally fine that we recognize his birth on December 25th. Now, this one is going to really mess with you. Number six, Luke 2, 7 doesn't mention the ox and the lamb keeping time as the little drummer boy <laughs> drums on his drum. I can't find it. I looked for it. I couldn't find that one. Luke 2, 7, number seven, says Jesus was laid in a manger, not in a wooden crib. We have a wooden crib in our backyard, so if you have one too, it's okay. See, a manger was a stone feeding trough, which means there were probably animals present, but do you know this? The Bible never says there were animals present when Jesus was born. Number eight, even though one of our beloved carols declares these words, no crying he makes. I just want to say, it's very likely baby Jesus cried. Well, just extrapolate. Later, when Lazarus died, the Bible says what? Jesus wept. Remember, Jesus is fully God and fully man. In addition, Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Number nine, the Bible doesn't say the angels sang. You're like, what? No, Luke 2.13 indicates the angels were praising God and saying Luke 2, 7 doesn't say the angels were present at his birth. You're like, no, what? Though it's likely they were, but the Bible doesn't say they were there at his birth. Number 11, Matthew 2, 11 never says there were three wise men, but does mention three gifts which were given. 
Hey, while I'm talking about wise men, there's no indication they came on camels either. It just says they came. Number 12, speaking of the wise men, they did not arrive the night of Jesus' birth. Now that messes with our nativity scenes, doesn't it? No, it's more likely they came up to two years later. Matthew 2.11 indicates they went into, you can look this up, went into the house and saw the child, Greek word for toddler. Number 13, contrary to most manger scenes, the Bible doesn't state there was a star over the place where Jesus was born. Though you can look this one up, the star is mentioned three times in Matthew chapter 2, indicates that the star caused the wise men who studied the skies, right, to head out on a journey, and when they got closer, the star guided them to the, what, house where Jesus was. Well, we're continuing in our series called The Cast of Christmas. And so far, we pondered the Old Testament prophecies and how they've been fulfilled with pinpoint precision by the birth of Jesus. Last week, Pastor Ed did a super job explaining the roles of angels in the Christmas narrative, and I'm so glad to be part of a team of pastors who know how to preach. He did a great job. We were up in Wisconsin for my mom's funeral for that, so yeah. So for our three Christmas Eve services, we're going to focus on Jesus, the main character of Christmas. Well, let's circle back to the shepherds. Most of us don't give them a second thought. Well, today, let's give them a second thought. That serene Christmas card image of sweet shepherds singing songs by the campfire, that's probably a bit exaggerated. We've sentimentalized the shepherds. Shepherds were actually ostracized. They were shiftless, often very dishonest. They were more likely to be cussing than singing carols. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? (laughs) But throughout Israel's history, shepherding was a very noble profession. Think of Abel. He was the first to have that occupation, followed by Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. God calls himself a shepherd. And guess what? He compares us to sheep, which isn't a compliment (laughs) at all. But by the time we come to the first century, shepherding has lost its luster. There were few jobs more demanding or more degrading than being a shepherd. Shepherds made up the lowest class of people. They came in just ahead of the lepers. The Talmud, which is a collection of interpretations from the rabbis, says this, quote, no help is to be given to heathen or shepherds. And so these simple shepherds were considered ceremonially unclean because of the nature of their work. They were unable to attend any religious services. As a result, they're isolated and forgotten. Their flocks often needed to be moved from field to field to find new grass, fresh water, so they never stayed in one place very long. They were treated with contempt and mistrust. They were often suspected of stealing from others. Their testimony was never allowed in court. Why? Because they were considered to be unreliable, dishonest. These guys were brash and they were bold. They lived away from society, which as a result made them very unappealing to most people. Most of them had foul mouths and were accustomed to fighting. Now, don't miss what I'm going to say next. God entrusted the greatest message ever to a bunch of salty shepherds. 
I love that. But that's not so unusual, is it? God has always worked wonders for the little, the least, the forgotten, the lost. And if you were to read through Luke's narrative, you would see how Jesus came for the marginalized, for the poor, for the forgotten, and for those who are considered to be outcasts. Well, as we study the shepherds today, here's what I want us to get. God moves us through a specific process, and we're going to see the process the shepherds went through, so that you and I can make progress spiritually. Luke chapter 2 gives us God's version of a birth announcement. One pastor says, nowhere else in the birth narratives does God directly proclaim to anyone that Jesus was born except to these shepherds. Oh, would you listen to Luke chapter 2 as if for the first time, and that's not easy, is it? Because we kind of hear the story and then we can tune out. Yeah, I know that, but just as we thought we knew this, all the characters of Christmas, let's lean in now and let's see if we can hear this as if you're just hearing it for the first time. Listen then to these words. And in the same region, there were shepherds. They were out in the field. What were they doing? They were keeping watch over their flock. We're told when? By night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. They didn't see that coming. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with what? great fear. You would be too. They're like, whoa. They're filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, so this angel not only appears, this angel speaks, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. What is that? What's the great, what's the good news of great joy? For unto you, shepherds, is born this day, tells us where, in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then so they don't miss it, they're given a sign. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a feeding trough, a manger. Well, I see five steps the shepherds took. Note the first thing. They're just guys who are being attentive to their jobs. Luke 2, verse 8, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks. Not only did they work the third shift, they worked the first and second shift as well. It was a 24-7 deal. That phrase, keeping watch, literally means watching watches. Interesting backstory here. Near Bethlehem on the road to Jerusalem was a tower known as Migdal Eder, or the watchtower of the flock. This was often where shepherds watched the flocks. Listen, flocks that were destined for sacrifice in the temple. It was a settled conviction among the Jews that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. Remember, where's that prophecy from two weeks ago? Anyone? Right, Micah 5, verse 2, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That prophecy given 700 years earlier. So not only where the Messiah was to be born, but equally that he was to be revealed from Migdal utter this particular watchtower. Isn't it intriguing? The Lamb of God was born in the area set aside for sheep to be sacrificed. Jesus is the good shepherd, right? Luke 10, 11, he said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But the good shepherd is also a sheep. John the Baptist declared in John 1.29, he is the lamb 
of God who takes away the sins of the world. Friends, don't miss this. God came to those who were attentive to their jobs. They were doing what they were supposed to do. They're not sleepy slackers. No, these are guys willing to work. I came across a career builder survey of 2,000 hiring managers and HR professionals, and they said the top two qualities that companies look for in employees is number one, the ability to work hard, and number two, dependability. Work hard and show up. You have read, haven't you, that companies are struggling to find employees today? (laughs) As an example, this week Beth and I were at South Park buying a gift for one of our grandchildren and we're standing in line and I'm just making small talk with the woman who was ringing up our purchase and, and I said, wow, is it, has it been hard here? Are you working a lot of hours? She goes, yeah, I'm working a lot of hours. We don't have enough help. And then she looked at Beth, looked at me and she offered us both jobs. <laughs> I wasn't tempted, but well, even without an interview, right? Question, are you working hard? Can others depend on you? Are you keeping watch over your work? See, whatever God has called you to do, be attentive to it. Do it with excellence. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for who? The Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That's Colossians 3, 23 and 24. So no matter what kind of job you have, you are not insignificant to Emmanuel. Remember what people thought of shepherds. He will meet you right where you are as you work faithfully at what he's called you to do. God moves us through a specific process so that we can make spiritual progress. Number two, there's the next step in their journey. They were awed. So they're attentive to the responsibilities they're given, but the shepherds are awed by this angelic announcement. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They're filled with great fear. God meets us where we are, and then he often brings us to our knees. God's Shekinah glory lights up the sky, and these tough guys shake in their sandals. The word appeared can refer to a sudden assault. The narrative is designed to impress upon us the sudden and unexpected arrival of Adonai's angel on this silent night. For the first time in centuries, the glory of God has returned to earth. Remember, there's been 400 silent years. And now an angel appears. And that cry expressed in Isaiah 64, 1 is being answered, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. The heavens now have opened. The angel has come down. Now I was pondering that. Maybe the shepherds were terrified because they didn't know if this was an angel of judgment or not. Maybe they're like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Maybe the angel had been sent as payback for their raunchy jokes, their bad language, their sticky fingers. Maybe they were worried their sins were catching up with them and they're about to be vaporized. Whatever the case, they were in awe. And it would take a lot for these tough guys to be terrified. I wonder if Judges 13, 22 was in their minds, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. Like it's over. To be sore afraid, don't you love that phrase? That's the phrase Linus uses in Charlie Brown's Christmas. That's the King James, sore afraid. And perhaps the Bible you're using says greatly afraid. It literally means this, to fear with great fear. Whenever somebody comes face to face with God's holiness, they cannot help but fall apart because of their own sinfulness. Peter had a similar response, Luke 5, 8. He said this to Jesus, get away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. 
This week I spent some time contemplating the miracle and the mystery of the incarnation because I, I need to grow in awe. And my guess is you do too. So I just spent some time jotting down some phrases. The infinite became an infant. The sovereign as sacrifice. The great I am became incarnate. The deity in diapers. The immortal took on mortality. The ancient of days became the infant of days. The word came to our world. The maker of man became man. And finally, the God who is Lord is the Lamb of God. Question, do you marvel at the Messiah? As you focus on what happened at Christmas, are you in awe? Has it been a while since you've been awed by Emmanuel? Friends, God moves us through a specific process so you and I can make spiritual progress and we need to. Number three, accepted. So these angels, who are very attentive, are now filled with awe, and then they accept the message of good news. I'm in verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, we bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It's interesting how fear is the normal human reaction to an encounter with an angel. It's good to keep in mind because in our culture, people think of angels as these little cherubs that are cute. And Whenever somebody came face to face with an angel, they were greatly afraid. It would be a good study to do. Let me just pick three. How about Zechariah? Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear fell upon him. Mary, greatly troubled at the saying. Joseph, angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Notice that little word, behold. It means look now. I like Matt Papa's insight. Christianity's first call is not behave. This is so good. The first call is to behold. Friends, Christianity is not simply moralism, like clean yourself up, behave, do the right thing. No, we're called first to behold, then to believe, And then our behavior follows. So the angel tells them to chill out. That's actually my translation. Why? Because he's bringing good news of great joy. That's the word megas. means exceedingly large, loud, mighty. It's a superlative of greatest degree. Wycliffe translates it like this, I evangelize to you a great joy. In Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, joy is often linked to salvation. I've mentioned this before, but we received a Christmas card several years ago, and I've never forgotten it, because it captures the sense of awe (laughs) and joy Here's what it said inside. We opened it up. It said, may your steps jingle with delight and anticipation this time of year. Friends, you and I must remember this message will be for all people. Do you know that includes the people you don't like? It includes your neighbors. Not just that one neighbor you like. No, all your neighbors. All your coworkers. All your classmates. It's everybody, your neighbors and to the nations. Verse 11 contains the heart of the birth announcement. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Oh, that's just packed. Notice the three words to describe this baby born in Bethlehem. He is Savior. 
He's the one who will save us from our sins. The name Jesus means the one who saves. He is Christ. That's in Hebrew, it's Messiah. It means the anointed one, and he is Lord. That's the Hebrew word Adonai, referring to master or owner. It speaks of his right to have total possession of everyone and everything, and inherent in that is our need of absolute submission to him. That's quite a birth announcement that these shepherds received. The shepherds are told what to look for in verse 12. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Now, God thought it necessary to give them a sign because of the extraordinary nature of the message they had just received. This sign has two parts, right? Baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. manger. There's a couple interesting theories behind the sign of swaddling cloths or swaddling clothes. Well, here's the first. In the harsh countryside of the Middle East, sometimes people would die when they were on long trips. And so to be prepared for that possibility, travelers would take this long, thin, gauze-like cloth and wrap it several times around their waist under their clothing. So when an individual died, friends or family would remove that swaddling cloth and wrap the body from head to toe. Now, in this theory, and it's a theory, we don't know exactly, the baby Jesus could have been wrapped in Joseph's death cloth. See, the sign for the shepherds was a baby prepared for death. Interestingly, the body of Jesus would one day be wrapped in strips of cloth for his burial. He entered the world bound, and he exited the world bound. Not really, right? Because he rose from the dead. Well, there's a second possibility behind this sign, and I did some digging into this, and on this one too, I'm not entirely certain, but here's what I discovered. According to Jimmy DeYoung, who quotes Alfred Edersheim, an expert on Jewish life, the primary task of these particular shepherds was to raise male lambs without blemish, firstborn male lambs without blemish for temple sacrifices. So when a firstborn male lamb was born, the shepherd would catch the kid wrap it in swaddling cloths, and place it in a manger until the mother came over and introduced herself to her baby. It was a way to make sure that lamb, that kid, didn't get hurt or injured. One commentator writes this, that these strips of cloth could have come from old priestly garments that were used to light the menorah in the temple and then reused to wrap sacrificial lambs at birth. Here's what one commentator writes. When the shepherds looked at Jesus wrapped in old priestly garments, they saw their Savior, the great high priest, who is both the Lamb of God and the light of the world. Wrapped in swaddling cloths and placed where? In a manger. Now, it was common to see babies swaddled. Moms do that today. Holds them tight, helps them be feel secure. (laughs) But it would have been very unusual to see a baby swaddled and lying in a feeding trough. Well, suddenly, a whole regiment of rejoicing warrior angels fills the sky. Remember, if you read Luke chapter 2, first there's one angel who gives the message, and then the whole sky fills up with them. And they praise God in this thunderous voice, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The glory of God extends grace to those who are out of place, and peace 
to those who have no peace. Now, we know the shepherds welcome this message favorably. How do we know that? Well, look at verse 15 of Luke chapter 2. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Hey, have you favorably welcomed the message and have you allowed the word of God to work in you? God's good news is a gift that must be received in order for it to be activated in your life. It's one thing to say you accept it. It's another to act on it. The shepherds acted on it. Knowing must lead to going. God moves us through a specific process because he wants you and I to make progress spiritually. So first, they were attentive, and the shepherds were in awe. Then they accepted the message, and note next, they acted on it. They went to see so they could witness what had taken place. I'm in verse 16 now, and they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. That word haste has the idea of, come on, hurry up, don't delay, let's go. That really is the first Christmas rush. (laughs) It's amazing. Think about this. Normally, shepherds receive their pay for protecting their flock. And now, they say, let's leave and go find this baby wrapped in cloths lying somewhere in a manger. Oh, on top of that, shepherds were slow, patient in their movements. They didn't want to spook the sheep. They walked slowly. Well, here it says they went with haste. Friends, the Bible's clear. Acceptance must lead to action. Where James 2.7 says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Dead. They could have doubted. Maybe I would have. Maybe not with all those angels. They certainly could have delayed. But they decided to mobilize and then they moved. Let's notice what these first responders did. First, they went and saw. First thing they did was bounce to Bethlehem so they could see this baby with their own eyes. And the word found means to find after a thorough search. I picture these guys looking everywhere for this baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Check out these ironies. First, unclean shepherds come to a manger to see the holy of holies lying in it. Second, the shepherds left their flocks behind to visit the sinless Lamb of God. Third, a millennium earlier, King David kept watch over his sheep in these same fields outside Bethlehem. And now, these shepherds See the son of David born in the city of David. Fourth, the shepherds shepherds are captivated by the creator born as a creature. This makes me think of 1 Timothy 3.16. Great is the mystery of godliness. It's, It's a mystery and it's a great mystery. What is it? God was manifest in the flesh. So they went and saw, but notice next, they left and they shared. They didn't spend a lot of time there. I'm in verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. The phrase made known means to make known in such a way that people can understand. Let me just point out something. Their message has nothing to do with the angels. They're not like, whoa, we saw these amazing amazing angels. It was incredible. Would you also notice there's no mention of Mary? There's no worship of Mary. There's no veneration of Joseph. It's all about who? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. 
And they go and they share that message. They came to see the Savior and now they head out to herald the good news about him. They were all about sharing the news concerning this child. Listen, have you ever thought of this? You and I are here today because they couldn't keep quiet. They're the first ones to get the announcement. And they left and told the news. They didn't hang around the manger because as the world's first missionaries, they knew they were now managers of that message. Verse 18 describes how the people respond. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. I'm sure they did. They're like, what? To wonder means to be amazed and astonished. By the way, that that word wondered is used 12 times in the Gospel of Luke to show people's response to Jesus. Which leads to a question. Are you astonishingly amazed when you consider what Christ has done? Listen, if you're not saved yet, you need to come and see the Savior. If you are saved, it's time to go and share the Savior with others. It's not enough to just say you have faith or to feel good about something. There comes a time after seeing that you and I must be involved in sharing. God moves us through a specific process so we can make spiritual progress. I see one more step in the process God took the shepherds through. We could say they adored. Do you know they go back to their same jobs? But they don't go back as the same people. They returned to where they started. They worked faithfully. They worshiped fervently. But their extraordinary experience did not make them withdraw from the work God gave them to do. Listen to verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. They didn't just wonder about what they saw. They worshiped him. In one sense, they're taking the place of the angels because they're now glorifying and praising God. Friends, listen, one clear evidence of conversion is a commitment to worship. Unfortunately, many of us worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. When a person is genuinely saved, he or she will seek to bring glory to God, to gather with God's people, to praise him for who he is and for what he has done. Oh, friend, would you this Christmas allow yourself to adore Emmanuel and to glorify and praise him for all that you've seen in and heard. You can return to the same place after Christmas, but not as the same person. Listen to these words from a writing called Bethlehem's Best. It was written by Donald Cantrell. In yonder ages, the word was proclaimed that a baby would be born, Jesus would be his name. Years passed by and the world stood waiting. Something had to occur that left no debating. Out of the blue on an awesome starry night, some shepherds had a visitor that left them a fright. When time came, God ignored all the rest and sent his angel to Bethlehem's best. As the heavenly host praised loudly with one voice, the shepherds were inspired and were eager to rejoice. Into the night they fled with no regard to danger to the city of David for the babe in the manger. Into the city so boldly they each walked, the angelic proclamation was the center of their talk. The events of this night was shared from east to west all because of the visit. By Bethlehem's best. The shepherds were changed. They were changed forever by what they saw. And you can be as well. And maybe you're like, I can't change. I'm in a habit. I'm in a rut. I don't know if I can ever change. Yes, you can. Because God moves us through a specific process so we can make spiritual progress. And so let's take these five points and apply them to us. We can profit from the process the shepherds went through, number one, by being attentive, observant to what God has called you to do. Secondly, be awed by God's message. And everything he wants for you is right here. It's right in this book. Accept the gift of good news and then act on what you know to be true. And then make sure you're adoring Emmanuel always. 
Let's make sure we get the facts straight about the Christmas narrative. And once we do, let's believe and receive the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Christmas is real history, but it must become your story. Listen to Luke 2.11 one more time. Today, that's right now, a specific time in history. In the town of David, that fulfills a 700-year-old prophecy, a Savior, the one who saves from sin, has been born. That's the incarnation where the infinite became an infant to you. I love that. That's emphatic. Jesus came to you personally for you. He is Christ, the long-awaited anointed one, the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the great I am, Adonai, sovereign, master, and leader. Jesus was born to the whole world, but he was born to you and for you. As your substitute, he died in your place. I close with three questions. Is he Savior to you? Is he Christ to you? And is he Lord to you? What he says goes. I quote this, I'm sure, every December. Corey Ten Boom once said this. If Jesus were born 1,000 times in Bethlehem and not in me, then I would still be lost. It's time to make sure Jesus is born in you. And you could do that tonight by praying along with me. Would you close your eyes? And if this describes where you're at tonight, you could say these words silently. Lord Jesus, I don't understand how you can love me when I don't measure up, when I fall down, when I live in ways that don't please you, I confess that I'm a sinner and I repent. I turn from the way I've been living. I need you to be my savior. Would you save me from my sins and from myself? For you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I desire to live under your lordship for the rest of my life. Thank you for not only being born, but for dying in my place and rising again so I can be born again. I now receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness. I ask you, Jesus, come into my life. Make me into the person you want me to be by enabling me to bring glory to you and good to others. Help me to work faithfully, to wonder fearfully, to welcome favorably, to witness frequently, and worship you totally. In the name of Emmanuel, Yeshua, who is Savior, Christ and Lord, I ask this, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to chat with you after the service, but remember this, Jesus came for all people. He came for the faithful and the unfaithful. Oh, come, all you unfaithful, come, weak and unstable, come, know you are not alone. Oh, come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come, see what your God Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. Oh, come, bitter and broken, come 
with fears unspoken come taste of his perfect love oh come guilty and hiding once there is no need to run see what your God has done Christ is Christ is